In a time that was long ago, in a time that is now, things seemed impossible. Brave people fought and survived, holding close what matters most, creating a future for their children, honoring the lessons of their forebears. They were so tired. But every time their strength almost failed, they found just a little bit more. Surrounded by enemies, they lit a tiny bit of oil. To say to each other, this matters. To say to the ages, this is who we are. To say to their God, you above all. They knew they did not have enough oil to last. But still they set flame to wick. They had come too far not to do so. Everyone knew they did not have enough oil. But the oil did last. One night's oil burned for eight nights. For God. For the ages. For each other. In a time that was long ago. In a time that is now. The lights of Hanukkah shine in the night. In a time that was long ago. In a time that is now. People find fuel and dare to set fire to it knowing it cannot last. But, But sometimes, sometimes it lasts. lasts. Sometimes, sometimes it lasts. lasts. In the beginning, long ago, before men or seasons, two brothers were born. One brother was radiant, and everywhere he went bloomed with life. He wore the crown of oak, a tree known for its strength, beauty, and noble presence. His brother, while equally as cheery, knew that every light needed dark, and so with him came the darkness and slumber. Trees would lose their leaves in preparation for his cold spells, and the animals would hide away in the warmth of their burrows and dens. He took for his crown the evergreen holly. Both brothers ruled in harmony, although they did quarrel from time to time about the need for more light or more darkness. No one knows what caused their rift. Some say it was a beautiful goddess that loved them both, Rise of the Oak King. Others say the creation and rise of humans drove the brothers to quarrel. Whatever the reason, each day the brothers overstepped, testing the bounds of their rage. Men loved the bright sunny days and longed to stay in the court of the Oak King. They lent their support to the Oak King and he grew more powerful. He was their fertility god, their green man of the woods. The Holly King, unsupported and alone, fled the lands for some time and the world thrived in an unbroken summer. Over time, the people grew worried about death and darkness. The plants who, who, whose bloom had once been celebrated were now commonplace. The eternal cycle of life and death was broken. The Oak King was weak without rest. Return of the Holy King. The Holy King from, watched from afar until one fateful day he returned. The two brothers fought a deadly battle for the crown. Tired and spent from keeping the world green, the Oak King fell and his crown passed to the hall, and onto the Holly King, who made quick work bringing steady death and decay to the lands he, as he blanketed the world in snow. The days grew shorter, so the people and animals were finally able, able to rest. All of the trees lost their leaves and were burdened except for the, except the pine and holly trees which reigned supreme. Some say the holly king did not actually kill his brother but put him to rest and the battle was a plot between them to ensure the changing of seasons without many from him. Others say he's grown cold and exiled and slew his brother where he stood. The Eternal Battle So, either way, during the winter solstice or Yule, when the Holly King was at the height of his power, he was surprised to see his brother alive and well. The Oak King had risen, and after a raging battle, he emerged victorious. The Holly King was defeated, and the Oak King went to work bringing spring and life back to the world. Each year, When the other was at its strongest, the Oak King or the Holly King would emerge to battle for the crown. You might be asking yourself, why would they choose the night when the other was at his best to battle? Surely the Oak King would be defeated at Yule when he was at his weakest 
and the Holy King would be defeated during midsummer. Some legends actually shift to change the time of the battles, but it is believed that despite being at the height of their power, their death indicates the beginning of their failing strength and that it is time for a new king. The Shortest Day So the shortest day came, and the year died, and everywhere down the centuries of the snow-white world came people singing and dancing to drive the dark away. They lighted candles in the winter trees. They hung their homes with evergreen. They burned beseeching fires all night long to keep the year alive. And when the New Year's sunshine blazed awake, they shouted, reveling. Through all the frosty ages, you can hear them echoing behind us. Listen. All the long echoes sing the same delight this shortest day. As promise wakens in the sleeping land, they carol, feast, give thanks, and dearly love their friends and hope for peace. And so do we here, now, this year and every year, welcome you all. All throughout these months, as the shadows have lengthened, this blessing has been gathering itself, making ready, preparing for this night. It has practiced walking in the dark, traveling with its eyes closed, feeling its way by memory, by touch, by the pull of the moon, even as it wanes. So believe me when I tell you this blessing will reach you, even if you have not light enough to read it. It will find you even though you cannot see it coming. You will know the moment of its arriving by your release of the breath you have held so long, a loosening of the clenching in your hands, of the clutch around your heart, a thinning of the darkness that had drawn itself around you. This blessing does not mean to take the night away, but it knows its hidden roads, knows the resting spots along the path, knows what it means to travel in the company of a friend. So when this blessing comes, take its hand, get up. Set out on the road you cannot see. This is the night when you can trust that any direction you go, you will be walking toward the dawn. This is the story of the great god Maui, who was born to Hina of the fire on the seashore. Separated from his mother, Maui was adopted by the gods, who raised this mischievous and troublesome human as their own. Maui was not the perfect model of human beauty, but he certainly kept the gods busy. He raised islands from the ocean, he taught the, the humans how to coax fire from wood, and eventually, one day, he decided to set off and find his mother, Hina of the Fire. Along his way, he threw the sky up above the mountains where it remains to this day. Maui had many adventures before he was reunited with his mother. She was delighted he had found her. Maui told his mother he had noticed that the sun hurried across the sky so quickly that there was barely enough time for work to be done. The fishermen had just gotten in place to toss out their nets and already it was time to return home. The plants did not ripen. His mother, a masterful maker of fabric, gave him strong strands of twisted fiber before she sent him to his grandmother, who cooked the son's breakfast. His grandmother lived high in the mountains next to a massive willy willy tree, which was the place where the son paused to eat breakfast every morning. When his grandmother found out who he was, she wondered why he had come. Maui claimed that he had come to capture the sun, for it traveled too quickly through the sky. The crone instructed him on how he might catch the sun. She made space for Maui to hide in the branches of the willy-willy tree. She gave him a magical stone to use as a battle axe and told him to watch for the first leg of the sun to come up over the horizon. Catch that with the first of your ropes and fasten it to the tree. Do this with each of the ropes your mother fashioned for you. Once the sun is securely fastened to the tree, move in with the stone axe and you will be able to land your blows upon the body of the sun. As instructed, Maui hid himself in the branches of the great tree and waited. Soon, the first leg of the sun crept over the mountainside, 
that first ray of the sun starting to illuminate the day. Immediately, Maui rose and threw his fiber rope, capturing the first leg of the sun and tying it to the mighty tree. This he did with each of the sun's legs until the sun was truly entangled within the branches of the great Willy Willy tree. Realizing all of his legs were caught, the sun tried to escape by sliding back down the mountain. But Maui pulled on the ropes until the sun was forced to rise again. Then, Maui caught up his magic stone axe and braved the extreme heat to move up close and use the axe to strike at the sun, to break eight of the sun's 16 legs. So, for half of the year, the sun moves swiftly across the sky and the days are short, for the sun is on its good legs. The other half of the year, the sun is slower across the sky because he's limping, and we have Maui Trickster to thank for our long days of enjoying the warmth and glory of the sun. The Nourishing Dark by Richard Gilbert. We pause in the holy quiet of the nourishing dark. The days are shorter now, darkness overtakes light. We miss the sparkling daylight hours, the long days of brightness and activity. We yearn for their swift return and wonder if we can wait, or if our patience will at last give out. We forget the nourishing dark at our own peril. There is mystery in the dark to be probed. There is adventure of that which cannot be known, cannot be seen, can only be experienced in the soul. There is deepness in the dark, impenetrable and inviting. In the darkness, we rest our bodies and our souls. We escape that which distracts and confuses. We come face to face with ourselves. We come into the deep places of our being. Darkness is not mere absence of light. Darkness is not simply an interval between days. Darkness is the softness of things. The blessed quiet of the night. May we not bemoan the dark, but relish it. May we feel its powerful presence and rejoice in its mystical embrace. May we celebrate the deep and nourishing dark. On the first day of winter, the earth wakens to the cold touch of itself. Snow knows no other recourse except this falling, this sudden letting go. Over the small domed bushes, all the empty and trees, snow puts beauty back into the withered and the malnourished, into the death wish of nature in the deliberate way. Winter insists on nothing less than deference, waiting all its life Snow says, let me cover you. I'm Lisa Gilley, and on behalf of our board of trustees at Countryside Church, I wish you and your loved ones joy and peace, and thank you for all that you do and all that you give to Countryside Church throughout the year. In the words of the late Reverend Eileen Carpellis, if that which is most holy lies within the human person, and if the greatest power in the world shines flickering and uncertain from each individual heart, then it is easy to see the value of human associations dedicated to nurturing that light, the friendships, the family, the religious community. For the power of good in any one of us must at times waver. But when a group together is dedicated to nurturing the power of good, it is rare for the light to grow dim in all individuals at the same moment. We know that your financial gifts to Countryside Church come from hard work and sacrifice, and we thank you for your contributions. Giving reminds us that we are part of something greater than ourselves and that together we have enough. May our gifts 
sustain and grow the life of Countryside Church, and nurture the power of good. May we give in love and in hope. During this season, as the daylight hours begin to grow longer, may you find moments of peace and gratitude, moments of beauty and wonder. May this faith and our community renew your strength and hope as we approach the new year. Blessings to you and your loved ones. A long, long time ago, when the earth was young, she would play all day with the sun. The sun was young too, you see, and they had lots of energy, probably like many of you young ones here. The earth had many names. Some called her goddess, the maiden, her sister. Nobody called her grandmother yet. She was too young for that. The sun was bold, hardly ever sleeping rising so early and warming the earth day after day after day and they played together with wild rollicking joy but of course as the goddess earth grew up she knew there was work to do so she would get up early with the sun and go about her work blooming flowers helping the trees grow big and strong helping to weave nests and dig burrows for all the animal friends one of the goddess's best friends was a cardinal, a bright red bird who loved to play with the goddess and the sun, joining their games and helping with their work. The cardinal loved to sing. He would sing his heart out when the sun god got up in the morning and again when the sun god was settling down for bed at night. But as the goddess earth and the sun god grew older, the cardinal noticed that they were settling down a bit slowing down a bit, you might say, and the Cardinal realized that he too wanted to settle down and maybe find someone to love and cherish. So he sang his song, and sometimes the goddess would hold him on her finger and sing back to him. The earth and the sun fell in love, and soon so did the red bird, with another Cardinal, whose color was not as brilliant as his bright red plumage, but to his eyes, 
she was brighter than the sun himself. The Karno and his mate sang together. They created a nest together, and soon eggs appeared in the nest followed not long after by little hatchlings. The baby birds were so cute. The goddess Earth came to admire them, and she brought gifts of a juicy caterpillar for each little open beak. The trees were lush with leaves, the air was warm with the sun's light, and all was well. But the cardinal began to realize that the goddess seemed more tired. Her belly was growing bigger, and he soon realized that she was going to have a baby. But the sun god, though he loved the earth, was also slowing down. It seemed he had aged many years overnight. The cardinal began to worry about his beloved friends. He would sing to them like before in the morning and again in the evening. But with the sun getting more and more tired, it seemed his songs were getting closer and closer together and a dark sky with Grandmother Moon was lasting longer and longer. Cardinal would bring gifts to the goddess, who sometimes rested on piles of leaves that had begun to fall from the trees. He would bring a nut or some seeds, a fluffy flower, or a red feather from his wing, trying to encourage her to run and play and work all day like she did in the early days. And so we return to our story with the concerned Cardinal tired goddess and an oh so quickly aging son who can't stay up in the sky for very long anymore. Don't worry little friend, said the goddess to the cardinal as she snuggled herself deeper in a blanket of mossy leaves. There's nothing wrong. We can't run and frolic and play and work non-stop. It can't possibly last forever without a break. Sometimes we have to just let go and rest. Despite her reassurance, the Cardinal was a little worried. It was all fine and good for the goddess Earth and the sun god to rest all day, but the air was getting cold. The leaves were falling off the trees. The bugs and nuts and fruits were becoming scarce. As he flitted around, worrying and hoping, gathering whatever he could find to eat and stay warm as the sky grew darker and darker, the goddess came to him and his partner. His babies had all flown off on their own by now. They still shared a life together, he and his beautiful brown love. The goddess's arms were full of fluffy green piles. You almost couldn't see the top of her head. These are for you. He set them down into the ground. To his surprise, Cardinal realized they were trees, big ones. How she had carried them, who knows? She's a goddess after all. While all the other trees had lost their large, flat leaves, these trees were full of lush green needles. We call them evergreens. They'll stay green for you and help keep you warm when the sun god did not provide his life for a while. Just nestle in their branches and remember the promise that the green will return. She smiled, a sort of sad smile. The sun god was aging rapidly now. The cardinal knew this. And the rumor throughout the forest was that he was dying. How will the green return? I know it's hard to talk about Mother Earth, but we all know the truth. The sun is dying, isn't it? This time the goddess smiled again, a sweeter smile, more filled with the kind of gentle joy, and she rubbed her belly. Yes, little bird, he is. But this is the sacred cycle of life. He will die and return to the earth, and then again the sun will be reborn. It will take the new baby sun time to grow and bring back the warmth and the green, but he will. He will grow and play and frolic and work. You'll see, little friend, you'll see. And so, as the forest was blanketed with thick snow, the Cardinal and his partner nestled deep in the branches of the evergreen trees, and they ate what they could find and they fluffed up their feathers for warmth and stayed very still in the long winter night. Remembering the busy, hectic, playful days gone by and realizing that it felt nice to just slow down, to see the stars, to sing and to snuggle. When it seemed like it couldn't get any darker, word spread throughout the forest. The sun god has died. The cardinal was sad, but he trusted what the goddess Earth had said. 
It was all part of the cycle. He decided to go and pay a visit to the goddess, so he left the safety and warmth of his evergreen tree and flew to her home where he found her resting under piles of silvery blankets. Were they furs? Clouds? Who knows? She's a goddess after all. Her eyes were closed, but he knew something was changing. She was breathing deeply in a way he had never seen before. He offered his help, but she shook her head. It's okay, little friend. It's all part of the cycle. And so he sang to her, and he brought her pine cones and snowflakes, and he and his partner flew to the sky and brought back starlight and wrapped the trees around her home with glittering, sparkling lights. And then, when they had waited and waited, they heard the sound of a baby's cry. And they, and they knew the sun had returned. returned. A silent night that brought healing. I've been moved by the magic of Christmas since the nuns in grammar school etched the words of the carols into my brain. That magic persists despite the memory of our prepubescent male voices that sounded more like a pond of bullfrogs than the Vienna Boys Choir. The music rose above us. Even our childhood rivalries and petty differences were no match for the spell of that music. I believe that Christmas music can touch the spirit. Those nuns taught me the music and the lyrics, but I would not learn of the real magic until about 10 years later. On Christmas Eve, 1968, I was a patient in a military hospital in Yokota, Japan. My leg had been shattered by a couple of machine gun bullets in a five hour battle in Vietnam. My body was full of shrapnel and my hands had been badly burned. For three weeks, army doctors in Vietnam struggled to save my leg. They sent me to Japan on that Christmas Eve to give a new team of surgeons a chance to work their magic. And I was in desperate need of magic. Somewhere it was Christmas, but it didn't feel like it to me. At least not until I heard the music pipe through the PA system. A chorus sang of peace on earth and mercy mild and promised God and sinners reconciled. Another voice called to let us all with one accord sing praises to our heavenly Lord and another to sleep in heavenly peace. But heaven and peace seemed so distant to me. My misery was interrupted by a low moan coming from the next bed. All I could see was a white cast shaped like a body, cutouts for his eyes, nose and mouth were the only breaks in the cast. Even as the music inched me toward comfort, the reality of pain anchored me in the present. But looking at my neighbor, enclosed in a God knows what kind of pain, mine didn't seem that important. The soft strains of Silent Night were filling the air of the ward when the nurses made final rounds with our medications. When my nurse approached, I asked her to put my bed closer to the man in the cast. I reached out and took my new friend's hand as the carol told us, all is calm, all is bright. We spoke no words to each other, none were needed. The carol revived the message of hope and the triumph of love for me. I felt a slight tightening on my hand, and for the first time that Christmas, I felt I would survive my ordeal. And for the first time in a long time, I wanted to. I believe there is magic in Christmas and the music that celebrates it because it brings us closer together and closer to our own hearts. The Lantern of Unity. In a small village nestled between snow-capped mountains and a frozen lake, there lived people of many backgrounds, each celebrating winter in their own special way. The village was a tapestry of traditions, and during the winter season, the air was filled with a delightful mix of melodies, scents, and lights from different corners of the world. One winter, a deep snow blanketed the village, and the cold seemed to seep into the bones of every home. As the days grew shorter and the nights longer, the villagers stayed inside, each family warming themselves by their own hearths, wrapped in their unique customs and tales. The village, once a vibrant hub of communal joy, became a patchwork of isolation. Among the villagers was a little girl named Lena, who noticed the absence of laughter and shared stories in the town square. With a hopeful heart, she crafted a large lantern out of old, colorful scraps of cloth representing the various cultures of the village. She placed a single candle inside, its light a symbol of unity. On the eve of the winter solstice, 
the longest night of the year, Lena walked to the center of the village and hung the lantern high for all to see. One by one, doors creaked open and curious eyes peeked out. The light of the lantern cut through the darkness and its warm glow beckoned the villagers out of their homes. Lena invited each person to share a story, a song, or a custom from their winter tradition as they gathered around the lantern. And so they did. There was the sound of a dreidel spinning from a Hanukkah tail, the sight of a Kwanzaa candles burning bright, the taste of sweet rice from a Persian Yalda night, and the cheer of a Santa Lucia song from the far north. The villagers found that within their own stories of light and warmth, there was more in common than they had thought. The lantern became a beacon of shared humanity and community spirit, melting away the walls they had built around themselves. From that year forward, the Lantern of Unity became a treasured tradition. Every winter, regardless of the deep snow or the biting cold, the village came together to share their light. It was a reminder that the true spirit of the season lay in the warmth of community and the light of diverse traditions shining together against the longest of nights. Happy Holidays! Inuit are a group of culturally similar indigenous peoples inhabiting the Arctic regions of Greenland, Canada, and Alaska. The Inuit of North America and Greenland tell the tale of the trickster raven, who in this case was instrumental in returning the light to the sky. There was once a wizard named Tupelak, and he was a very mean man. He had many magical things, but his most prized possessions were a pair of boots. These boots allowed him to take very long steps so he could travel far across the tundra in one single movement. Tupelak did not care for other people much at all. One day he decided he did not want to be with the other people anymore, so he put on his magical boots that let him take long steps. He skipped right up to the sky, took out his hunting knife, and cut a hole in the sky, which he crawled through. There was another world on the other side of the sky, which was dark and cold. But Tupelak was a pretty dark and cold fellow himself, so this world suited him just fine. He built a house for himself there. When his house was built, he went back through the hole in the sky to get his wife. He told her to pack up everything they owned so that she might come with him to their new home. Well, Tupelak's wife had a few things to say about the new world. She was not happy in the constant darkness. There were no neighbors and she was lonely. Tupelak gave her a daughter to care for to alleviate her loneliness. To solve the light issue was a bigger problem, but Tupelak was up to the challenge. He gathered up his hunting knife and two sturdy canvas bags, which he reinforced with his magics. Finally, he put on his magic boots that let him take long steps. He stepped over to the hole that led back to the world which he crawled through. Then he stepped right up to the sun and popped it into one of his magical bags. Using a sinew rope, he tied the bag tight, very securely, and slung it over his shoulder. As daring as that may seem, the still the sun, Tupelak was not yet done. He stepped right over to the moon and snatched the moon into the second bag. Then Tupelak took the sun and the moon back through the hole which shut the world off entirely from the light. Meanwhile, the raven was taking a nap. He would lift his head now and then to check if it was light out. But if it was time to wake, uh, but each time he saw the darkness, so he assumed he could just go back to sleep. He didn't realize anything was wrong until people started coming around to knock on his door, calling that they were cold and starving, asking him to do something on their behalf. The raven spoke with these people and discovered what had happened. He was not exactly a kind fellow, not the sort to go out of his way to help another unless there was something in it for him but he knew right away that this must be the work of Tupelak. The Raven and Tupelak had matched wits a few times, so the Raven was pleased to have a chance to defeat the evil wizard once again. He assured the people he would regain the sun and moon for them. He found the hole Tupelak had cut in the sky, so went to confront Tupelak. As he flew toward the hole, the Raven realized he would not be able to simply confront Tupelak and expect him to hand over the prize. He would have to watch this strange new world for a time to figure out how to steal the sun and moon back. Eventually, Raven saw Tupelak's lovely daughter. So, he changed himself into a feather that floated down the stream into her drinking water. Very soon, she had a baby that was none other than the Raven in disguise. 
Tupelac and his wife were the proudest of grandparents, and the mother goaded on this baby that was really the raven. They gave him everything he wanted. It was a pretty good life, but the baby that was the raven was constantly turning his gaze up to the two canvas sacks that hang near the ceiling of the house. One day, when Tupelac was out hunting, the baby reached up for the canvas bags as if he wanted to play with them. The grandmother and mother denied this demand, trying to distract the baby, but it did not work. The baby got very mad that he couldn't have his way. He started to make a fuss, then a ruckus, and then a whole heap of red-faced, mouth-opening wailing that probably was audible across the tundra, the two black, though the wizard was far away hunting. The women were frantic to keep the baby quiet, so finally they relented. When they gave the baby the bag which contained the moon, he calmed down. Mother and grandmother were relieved. Yet, the moment they let their guard down, the raven began to work at the sinews highs with a lot more dexterity in his baby fingers than one could suspect possible. In a blink of an eye, the moon was loose. It popped up to the ceiling like a helium balloon and out the chimney up into the sky. Tupelac saw the moon rise up, bump through the sky, and escape through the hole. Back into the world, he was wearing his favorite boots, so he took a long step to try and catch the moon, but he was too late. He returned to his home in rage where he demanded to know which of the women released the moon. When they told him the story and drew his attention to the baby, his rage strained as his heart softened at the sight of the little one. Tupelac was so smitten with his grandson that he could forgive him any offense. He told his wife to be more careful. The raven waited a while until Tupelac left the hunt once again before the baby started demanding the bag containing the sun. Again, at first, his mother and grandmother resist, doing their best to try to sidetrack his demands to ignore his tantrums, but in the end, Tupelac's wife brought down the last canvas sack. Before she handed it over to the baby, she tied the sinew rope secure with a second knot. Try as he might, the raven could not make his baby's hand undo that double knot, so he had to make a new plan. He snuck away to where he had hidden his raven cloak, donned it to transform himself back into his true form. Knowing his time was short, he took the sinew cord in his beak and made for the hole between the worlds as fast as he could fly. He heard Tupelac shout far out, and without even looking over his shoulder, he knew that his old foe had taken up the chase, using those magical boots that allowed Tupelac to take such long steps. But Tupelac had been far away when he realized there was a problem. So it would take him quite a few long steps to reach the hole he had cut in the sky. He did not make it in time to prevent the raven from scooching through the hole in the sky where he used his sharp beak to free the sun from its bag. The sun escaped and rose into the sky, bringing back heat and life to everything its rays touched. Tupelac was defeated, so he turned back. He does try to steal the light again year after year, but that just invites the raven to come and get it back. Hi, I'm Katie Johnson. Happy holidays, everybody. Uh, my husband, Jeff Johnson, was not able to read his part because he has COVID and has lost his voice, but he says happy holidays to everybody in a whisper. All right, this story is called The Elves and the Shoemaker. A shoemaker, by no fault of his own, had become so poor but at last he had nothing left but leather for one pair of shoes. So in the evening, he cut out the shoes, which he wished to begin to make the next morning. And as he had a good conscience, he lay down quietly in his bed, commended himself to God and fell asleep. In the morning, after he had said his prayers and was just going to sit down to work, the two shoes stood quite finished on his table. He was astounded and knew not what to say to it. He took the shoes in his hands to observe them closer, and they were so neatly made that there was not one bad stitch in them, just as if they were intended as a masterpiece. Soon after, a buyer came in, and as the shoes pleased him so well, he paid more for them than was customary. And with the money, the shoemaker was able to purchase leather for two pairs of yeah. shoes. He cut them out at night and next morning was about to set to work with fresh courage, but he had no need to do so. For when he got up, they were already made and buyers also were not wanting who gave him money enough to buy leather for four pairs of shoes. 
The following morning, too, he found four pears made. And so it went on constantly. What he cut out in the evening was finished by the morning, so that he soon had his honest independence again, and at last became a wealthy man. Now it befell that one evening, not long before Christmas, when the man had been cutting out, he said to his wife before going to bed, What think you if we were to stay up tonight to see who it is that lends us this helping hand? The woman liked the idea and lighted a candle, and then they hid themselves in a corner of the room behind some clothes which were hanging up there and watched. When it was midnight, two pretty little naked men came, sat down by the shoemaker's table, took all the work which was cut out before them and began to stitch and sew and hammer so skillfully and so quickly with their little fingers that the shoemaker could not turn away his eyes for astonishment. They did not stop until all was done and stood finished on the table and they ran away quickly. Next morning, the woman said, the little men have made us rich and we really must show them that we are grateful for it. They run about so and have nothing on and must be cold. I'll tell thee what I'll do. I will make them little shirts and little coats and vests and trousers and knit both of them a pair of stockings. And do thou too make them two little pairs of shoes, the man said. I shall be very glad to do it. And one night when everything was ready, they laid their presents all together on the table instead of the cutout work and then concealed themselves to see how the little men would behave. At midnight, they came bounding in and wanted to get to work all at once. But as they did not find any leather cut out, but only the pretty little articles of clothing, they were at first astonished. And then they showed intense delight. They dressed themselves with the greatest rap rapidity, putting the pretty clothes on and singing. Now we are boys so fine to see. Then they danced and skipped and leapt over chairs and benches. At last they danced out of doors. From that time forth they came no more, but as long as the shoemaker lived, all went well with him, and all his undertakings prospered. The end.
and I'm from Kirkjuk and I and my cat had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap when out of the lawn there arose such a clatter away to the window I flew like a flash tore open the shutters and threw up the sash the moon on the breast on the breast of the new fallen snow gave a luster of midday to objects below when I looked to my wondering eyes did appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer when a little old driver so lively and quick I knew in a moment he must be saying it more rapid than e eagles his courser they came and he whistled out shouted and called them by name now dasher now dancer now prancer and vixen on comet on cupid on donner and blitzen to the top of the wall to the top of the porch now dash away, now dash away, now dash away up. As leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled! His dimples, how merry! His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His drawl little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump and a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word and went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight Happy Christmas to all and a good night. Happy, Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. And 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 good night to all. Hi everyone, it's me, Marta Jones Shanae your friendly religious exploration manager. Team Jones is gathered round the fire today to wish all of our friends at Countryside Church UU a very Merry Christmas season. We know that you probably have a bunch of traditions that your family likes at this time of year. We do too. Elika, what are some traditions that you really like in the Christmas season? Putting up the tree, that's a good one. We do that as a family. Mm -hmm. I like decorating the tree and going out to see the Christmas lights. Cool. One of my favorite holiday activities is caroling. I love to sing, even though it's really hard for me to sing in public. As tough as singing may be for me, I think it's even more tough if I don't sing. See, I have this little light a spark inside me 
that loves music and loves to sing. And every now and then, well, I just have to let my light shine. Hey, that reminds me of one of my favorite Christmas songs, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I'm going to sing it for you. I've asked Team Jones to help me with the background part. Nathan has agreed to help me with it. Let's see if Elika will let her light shine too. Okay, ready? Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, reindeer had a very shiny nose. Like light bulb. And if you ever saw it, saw it, you would even say it glows. Like a light bulb. All of the other reindeer, reindeer used to laugh and call him names. Like Pinocchio. They never let poor Rudolph, Rudolph. join in any reindeer game. Like Monopoly. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then how the reindeer loved him, and they shouted out with glee, Yippee! Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, reindeer, you'll go down in his story. We hope to see each and every one of you at church this Christmas Eve. If you are there, come find me, because I have a little something for you to remind you to let your little light shine bright. Like a light bulb. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas for parents. In keeping with our poetic theme, this next reading goes out to all the parents who make the best Santa's helpers and inevitably collapse into bed in the wee hours of Christmas morning. This is Twas the Night Before Christmas for Parents. Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, I searched for the tools to hand to my spouse. Instructions were studied and we were inspired in hopes we could manage some assembly required. The children were quiet, not asleep, in their beds, while Mom and I faced the evening with dread. A kitchen, two bikes, Barbie's townhouse to boot, and thanks to Grandpa, a train with a toot. We opened the boxes, my heart skipped a beat. Let no parts be missing, or parts incomplete. Too late for last-minute returns or replacement. If we can't get it right, it goes in the basement. When what to my worrying eye should appear but fifty sheets of directions concise but not clear, which each part unnumbered and each slot named, if we so failed, we would could only be blamed. More rapid than eagles, the parts then fell out. All over the carpet they were scattered about. Now bolt it, now twist it, attach it right there. Slide on the seats and staple the stair. Hammer the shelves and nail to the stand. Honey, said hubby, just, you just glued my hand. And then in a twinkling, I knew for a fact that all the toy dealers had indeed made a pact to keep parents busy all Christmas Eve night with assembly required till morning's first light. We spoke not a word, but kept bent at our work till our eyes they went bleary, our fingers all hurt. The coffee went cold and the night it wore thin before we attached the last rod and last pin. Then lying the tools away in the chest, we fell into bed for a well-deserved rest. But I said to my wife just before I passed out, this will be the best Christmas without any doubt. Tomorrow we'll cheer, let the holiday ring, and not have to run for the store for one thing. The first Christmas carol was not sung by a heavenly choir. Hallelujah!
or even by a group of earnest friends such as you see here. It was not accompanied by the majestic chords of the piano or the clear notes of a trumpet or the light touch of a flute. The first Christmas carol was sung by the choir of life itself, whose voices came together for one brief moment of hope and promise. The first Christmas carol began with the sound of the low, faint moaning wind whipping sand over the hillsides. <laughs> then were added the introductory notes of footsteps on hard packed dirt road. and the clomping of a donkey bearing a heavy load. <coughs> the tapping of the staff of a man who sought shelter for his wife. Next, the song increased with the crackling of a million stars in a frost black sky. The hollow notes of a temple bell. the chanting of the priests in the town below, uh. and the marching of the Roman guards outside the gates. After a brief pause was heard the soft rustling of hay, and the closing of barn doors. the reluctant voice of a cow who had given up her place. Meow. And the excited bleating of a family of sheep discussing the strange events. Meow. And finally came the melody, the sharp, insistent cry of a baby. Meow. And the sighs of a mother's relief. <sighs> and the soft humming of a father's voice as he held the new baby in his arms. Our Christmas carols are songs that hope to capture the meaning of the birth of that baby. The first Christmas carol was the magic of that birth and the magic of the birth of every baby. Our Christmas carols are notes and symbols on a page telling us how to sing. The first Christmas carol is the melody that appears in our hearts telling us how to live. My name's Aiden. I'm Reverend Denise's son. And what are your pronouns? Ian. Him. I'm Reverend Denise. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm the minister here. I'm the interim minister. And Aiden and I wanted to talk a little bit about Christmas cookies. We have made Christmas cookies ever since you were tiny. Mm -hmm. What kind of cookies do we make? Usually like cookie cutter ones, but we took a class and that was about making like different types of cookies. And that was pretty recent. That yeah. A few days ago. We made Italian cookies for mm -hmm. that. Some of my favorites have been a lot of the funny things that we did, like we would sometimes make cookies that were uh, decorated like the Santas or the snowmen had bikinis. That was funny. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of different people come over to do cookies with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we love how many memories you make with cookies. And we recently found a book we want to share with you called A World of Cookies for Santa. Follow Santa's tasty trip around the world. <clears throat> we start in Christmas Island and all around the world, Christmas is a time for giving while Santa Claus, called by many names all over the world, packs his sleigh with gifts for children everywhere and they're preparing their own sweet gifts to follow him. 
So follow along on Santa's trip around the world where he gets to eat all different things in different countries. On Christmas Island, Christmati, also known as Christmas Island, it's the first place in the world to welcome Santa on Christmas Day. And that that little island the in the Southern Pacific they share their abundant coconut crop and leave sweet, chewy coconut macaroons. In New Zealand, uh, children remember the reindeer too and leave hay or carrots for them, as well as crunchy Anzac biscuits and milk for Santa. In Australia, Santa Claus uses his magic key to open the front door when he visits children. And he leaves small gifts in a sack or a stocking by their bedrooms. And their bigger gifts go under the tree. And their gift to him is a crispy, fruit-filled white Christmas tree because it's summer there. And they leave a cool glass of milk or a beer. I bet a lot of parents like that, too. huh? Maybe he leaves enough, you know, beer for everyone. Girls, not everyone. not everyone. No, no. Boys and girls just leave the, the beer for Santa. And they're probably too excited to sleep. So they might hear the sound of the bells that Santa leaves in their home as well. In Japan, uh, J- um, brains, gifts, and fortune to children. They believe he has eyes in the back of his head so he can watch the children who are misbehaving. After he lives, leaves their gifts on their pillows. H word again uh, enjoys a slice of strawberry top Christmas cake the children put out for him. That would be all about strawberry slice Christmas cake. In Indonesia, most homes don't have chimneys, so children put their shoes near the front door of a pretend fireplace that they make for stinker cloth to fill with glyph gifts. And in return, children leave him a taste of the tropics with Nastar cookies filled with pineapple jam. And in the Philippines, they go to bed and Filipino children double check to make sure their parents leave the front door unlatched so that Santa finds the children's gifts of puto seco, a crisp melt in your mouth cookie and a spicy ginger tea called slalabat. In uh, Sri Lanka, on Christmas Eve in Sri Lanka, uh, children come home from midnight mass and hang their stockings on a tree. After Nathalasea, Nathalasea, Christmas grandfather, puts their gifts in the stockings. He munches on cookies, a lacy fried cookie, while he sips the Ceylon tea the island country is famous. Mm, Ceylon tea, I like that. In India, children hang their stockings by a window if they don't have a fireplace, and they leave Christmas Baba, Father Christmas, a crispy fried treat called Kalukas, and a cup of spicy chai. In South Africa, uh, Father Christmas uh, arrives in South Africa by donkey. He fills the children's stockings with special chocolates and small gifts. They leave him Herzog cookies filled with apricot jam and topped with crunchy coconut meringue. Mm, I think I'd like that. How about you? Probably. Probably. In Malawi, Father Christmas brings gifts to children at Christmas parties at their school, and they thank him with mablada, sweet, sweet potato, potato cookies. cookies. <laughs> In Bethlehem, uh, as the site of the first Christmas, many people from around the world visit Bethlehem for this special holiday. Santa brings gifts to children in homes with a cross painted over the door. Children give him mamul, a cookie stuffed with dates, honey, and nuts. You know, this year they've told people not to come and make special trips to Bethlehem because it's too dangerous because of the war. So this year only the people who live there will be having those. We pray for them. In Egypt, 
children go to bed fairly early in hopes that Baba Noel will climb through the window and enjoy the cock, a sweet biscuit they put out for him and leave them gifts. What does that say? It's Don't say it again. Just keep going. All right. fine. Well, they're going to have sweet biscuits in Egypt. In Russia, dead Mora's grandfather Frost brings snow maiden to deliver gifts. She rides in a sleigh pulled by three horses. Children give them the gift of crying, Niki, a sweet honey spice cookie, and a cup of tea to warm them for the rest of their journey. In the Ukraine, Swatal St. Nicholas <laughs> slips in quietly to put gifts under the pillows of the children, and they leave a traditional St. Nick cookie for him. It looks like it looks like him, even. These pictures are very pretty. They look like they have spaghetti hair. They do look like <laughs> Denmark. <laughs> In Denmark, Christmas man <laughs> puts presents under the tree while the family eats Christmas dinner. When everyone is finished eating, the children will see the decorated tree for the first time. They thank a uh, Christmas man in person for their gifts by sharing rice pudding with him. Mm. Norway, the Christmas elf, comes into the house on Christmas Eve and asks, are there any good children here? And sometimes the children must sing for him before they receive their gifts. And the Christmas elf is thanked with some sweet rice pudding served with a cherry sauce. Poland. The star man visits families in Poland after their Christmas dinner. He asks the children's questions and rewards their answers with small gifts in return. They share fruit-filled treats with him and his companions, the star boys, who sing for the family. We make, those are klatschki. We make cookies like that recently. Mm -hmm. In Germany, children have been coming down the days, counting down the days until Christmas on their advent calendars. We have an advent calendar. And they open the last door on the advent calendar before they go to bed, excited to see what they will find under the tree. From the Christmas man, making the many kinds of Christmas cookies is an important part of the Christmas celebrations in Germany. Children leave a plate filled with springerly and gingerbread people. Sometimes those are called um, spritz cookies, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who do we have come on December 5th here? Who comes to Milwaukee? Mm -hmm. and we leave our shoes out. St. Nicholas. Nicholas, yeah. We get an early preview. In France, children leave carrots, oats, or apples in the shoes they place by the fireplace or Christmas tree. Noel takes the children's gifts to Gooey, the donkey, who carries his heavy sack. Then he fills the shoes with small gifts and treats. Sometimes they borrow the shoes from their parents because they hold more. Uh, for himself, Noel can choose from any of the 13 desserts families eat during Christmas Eve celebration. He really likes to have a slice of the Yule log, the glass of wine they leave for him. Nice. I love a Yule log. In Spain, children fall into bed late, tired from their festive Noche Buena celebration that brings the family and friends together for a big meal and singing and dancing. They put their shoes on their windowsills or balcony filled with treats of barley and wheat for the wise men's horses and camels. And one of the wise men leaves the children gifts. Turan, a nougat candy of almonds, honey, and sugar is the most popular treat to leave as a gift. Grandpa Tony used to get those for us when I was a kid. In the Basque country that lies between France and Spain, Ozentro, a coal miner from the Pyrenees Mountains, brings coal for the bad children and gifts for the good. Children clean their shoes and place them near the fireplace for him to fill. Children thank Ozentro for the gifts by leaving him a glass of wine and an almond tile cookies, which are shaped like roof tiles of their home. 
When I went to Spain, there was coal candy all over Spain to give, like, as a joke. Great Britain. Father Christmas fills the stockings of children in Great Britain. They leave him a gift or a fruit-filled mince pie along with a glass of sherry. Wow, I didn't know Santa drank so much all over the world. In Ireland, Santa must be very quiet as he slips to fill the stockings hung by the foot of the bed in Irish homes. Like in Great Britain, he'll find a mince pie and a glass of milk and sometimes a Guinness on the table along with a candle that will burn all night. Brazil. When he visits Brazil, Noel comes to the front door and finds the children's shoes beside the Christmas tree or nativity scene or next to their beds waiting to be filled with gifts. Children's, children uh, leave him a fudge-like sweet candy called Brigadero. I don't know. Uh, Argentina. In Argentina, Noel has to wait until the big firework displays are over before the children will be asleep for his visit. Boys and girls fill their shoes with a straw or br- barley from his uh, from his camels and leave Noel a crumbly cookie with a hint of licorice flavor and a sparkling cider. Mm. In Chile, chimneys and chilies are too narrow for... They held Pescaro, old man Christmas, so he climbs in a window and he leaves presents near the manger scene and he finds a plate with a gift of pan de pescala, a Christmas bread filled with candied fruit. Puerto Rico. Boys and girls in Puerto Rico leave a straw and shoe, leave straw and shoe boxes under their beds for the camels of the wise men. They also leave a cherry studded shortbread cookie for the wise men who bring the children gifts. In Costa Rica, gifts to the children are left by Cholado, and they bring him fragrant cypress trees. The Costa Rican children leave him a crunchy star-shaped sosprisos and a glass of rum poke, eggnog flavored with coconut. Mexico. Just after midnight, Mexican children get to break open their piñata filled with small toys and treats. After they go to bed, Santa arrives to bring their gifts. He looks forward to the nutty, sugar-coated Mexican wedding cookies they leave for him, along with a cup of sweet, spicy Mexican hot chocolate that warms him up as he heads for further north again, where it's cold. In the United States of America, children have decorated trees, hung their stockings, waiting for Santa and his reindeer arrive from Maine to California and all the states in between. Santa will find a glass of milk and a plate of cookies. Children might choose to leave him a decorated gingerbread person or an ice sugar cookie or the classic American chocolate chip cookie. They also sometimes leave carrots for Santa's reindeer. Canada. The nights are long in the northernmost part of North America, but Santa Claus finds his way to Montreal, Canada, by the millions of Christmas lights on display across the city. They can be seen from space. In the French-speaking region of Quebec, Noel warms himself by the fire while he fills children's stockings and enjoys the spicy fruit-filled hermit cookies they leave. They're perfect for dunking in milk, and the children leave with the cookies as he gets to gets to Canada's western coast, Father Christmas appreciates the warm pot of tea and rich layer Nanaimo bars the children leave for him. In Alaska, which is part of the U.S., but over by Canada there, Santa is pretty close to his North Pole home. There's even a town called North Pole, Alaska, but that's different. Alaskan children give him Eskimo cookies, a chewy, fudgy oatmeal cookie that is cooked on the top of the stove, not the oven. Hawaii. Hawaiian children won't hear the sound of hooves on their roofs, but they might see Santa's footprints in the sand where he hopped off the surfboard pulled by a dolphin. Kana Kaloka comes through the windows that are left open to allow the cooling trade winds to blow through. Children will find their gifts under the tree. They decorate with garlands, shells, and starfish. The presents they give to him, sweet, 
chewy pineapple macadamia bars is a refreshing treat. Yum. After visiting the last home in Pago Pago, Santa flies back to the wintry North Pole. He's warmed by the thoughts of the joy in all children he's visited and how they will feel when they open their gifts. By sweet memories of giving the spirit of children everywhere showed through the treats they shared with him. This book also includes lots of great recipes for some of the cookies that are mentioned here. And if you check it out, maybe you can make some of those too. Aiden and I have had a lot of fun reading this book with you and we've had great memories over the years being able to make cookies with our friends and family. And we hope you get to do that too. Thanks for reading this with me. Thank you. I love you. I love you too. Thanks. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Why was the snowman looking through the carrots? He was picking his nose! <laughs> How do you cut a Roman Empire in half? With a pair of Caesars. <laughs> What's the difference between the Christmas alphabet and the ordinary alphabet? The Christmas alphabet has no L! <laughs> what did Luke Skywalker say after he planted a Christmas tree farm? May the forest be with you. <laughs> what was Santa's fam favorite class? Chemistry. <laughs> what was Snowman's favorite breakfast? Ice Krispies. <laughs> what do you call an elf who sings? A rapper. <laughs> what do you call a snowman with a six pack? An abdominal snowman. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, Allison Vernon, your director of music at Countryside Church. And uh, I'd like to read to you the UU version of Twas the Night Before Christmas, I mean Solstice. And please bring your sense of humor. Twas the night before Solstice and all through the co-op, not a creature was messing the calm status quo up. 
The children were nestled all snug in their beds, dreaming of lentils and warm whole grain breads. We'd welcomed the winter that day after school by dancing and drumming and burning the Yule. A more meaningful gesture to honor the planet than buying more trinkets for mom or Aunt Janet. Or choosing a tree just to murder and stump it and dress it all up like seasonal strumpet. My life mate and I, having turned down the heat, slipped under the covers for a well-deserved sleep. When from out on the lawn, there came such a roar, I fell from my futon and rolled to the floor. I crawled to the window and pulled back the latch and muttered, ah, oh, where is that neighborhood watch? I saw there below through the murk of the night, a sleigh and eight reindeer of non-standard height. At the reins of that sleigh, said a mean-hearted knave who treated each deer like his personal slave. I'd seen him before in some ads for car loans plus fast food and soft drinks and cellular phones. He must have cashed in from his mercantile chores since self-satisfaction just oozed from his pores. He called each by name as if he were right to treat them like humans entrenching his might. Now Donder, now Blitzen, and other such aliases, showing his true Eurocentrical biases. With a snap of his fingers, away they all flew, like lumberjacks served up a plate of tofu. Up to the rooftop they carried the sleigh. The holes in the shingles are there to this day. Out bounded the man who went straight to the flu, and I knew in an instant just what I should do. After donning my slippers, downstairs did I dash to see this trespasser emerge from the ash. His clothes were all covered with soot, but of course, from our wood-fueled alternative energy source. Through the grime, I distinguished the make of his duds, he was dressed all in fur, fairly dripping in blood. We're a cruelty-free house, I proclaimed with such heat. He startled and tripped on the logs at his feet. But that wasn't all to make sane persons choke. In his teeth sat a pipe that was belching out smoke. I could scarcely believe what invaded our house, this carcinogenic and fur-wearing louse. Behind him he toted a red velvet bag, full to exploding with sinister swag. He asked, where is your tree? With a face somewhat long, and I said, out in the yard, which is where it belongs. But where will I put all the presents I've brought? I looked at him squarely and said, take the lot. To some frivolous people who think that they need to succumb to the sickness of commerce and greed whose only joy comes from the act of consuming, thus sending the stock of retailers booming. He blinked and said, Oh, but you're kidding. I gave him a stare that was stern and forbidding. Surely children need something with which to have fun. It's like childhood's over before it's begun. He looked in my eyes for some sign of assent, but I strengthened my will and refused to relent. They have plenty of fun, I cut to the gist, and your mindless distractions have never been missed. They take CPR so that they can save lives and go door to door for the used clothing drives. They recycle, renew, reuse, and reveal for saving the planet is a laudable zeal. When they padlock themselves to a fence to protest against nuclear power, we think they're the best. He said, but they're children. Lo, when do they play? I countered, is that why you've driven your sleigh to bring joy to the hearts of each child and tot? Hmm. All right, then. Open your bag. Let's see what you got. 
We need none of this, I announced in a huff. No business as usual holiday stuff. We sow in our offspring more virtue than this. Your toys offer some things they will never miss. The big man's expression was a trifle bereaved as he shouldered his pack and got ready to leave. I pity the kids who grow up around here who are never permitted to be of good cheer, who aren't allowed leisure for leisure's own sake, but must fret every minute. It makes my heart break. Enough histrionics don't pity our kids if they don't do as Macy's or Toys R Us bids. They live by their principles first and foremost and know what's important. To him did I boast. Pray, could I meet them? Oh no, they're not here. They're up on the roof liberating your dear. Then Santa Claus sputtered and pointed his finger, but mad as he was, he had no time to linger. He flew up the chimney like smoke from a fire, and up on the roof I heard voices go higher. I ran outside the co-op to see him react to my children's responsible, kind-hearted act. He chased them away, and disheartened and dismayed, he rehitched his reindeer, who had dolefully stayed. I watched with delight as he scooted off then. He'd be too embarrassed to come back again. But with parting disdain, do you know what he said? When this fur-wearing huckster took off in his sled? This reindeer enslaver, this exploiter of elves? Happy Christmas to all, in spite of ourselves. Merry Christmas.